This is a cyclotron, one of the most famous of these accelerators. The accelerating chamber, or tank, is fixed in the middle of the apparatus, between the poles of a very powerful electromagnet. The principle is ingenious. The tank, which is completely evacuated, contains two hollow D-shaped electrodes, to which a high-frequency alternating current is fed. Minute quantities of the gas, which is to provide the ions, are admitted. The ions are produced in the center of the tank by electrons from the small arc or filament. Once produced, they are sucked into one or other of the Ds by the powerful electric field. But this movement of the ions takes place between the poles of a big magnet. Consequently, the ions will travel with a circular motion in the magnetic field. The alternating voltage accelerates the particles each time they cross the gap from one D to the other, so that they are whirled round faster and faster until finally they are led off towards the target by means of a charged deflector plate. Here, an element is being set up and bolted into the target chamber ready for bombardment. Nowadays, it is known that almost all elements, if bombarded by neutrons, can be made radioactive for varying periods. Irene and Frederick Joliot Curie first produced artificial radioactivity, and Professor Fermi made brilliant advances in this field. As the operator moves off towards the control panels, he passes through the water screens, three and a half feet thick, which protect the scientists from the intense radiation produced by beams of accelerated particles. Now he begins to switch on the complicated high-frequency installation which feeds current to the Ds. To build and operate such machines, atomic physicists have had to become engineers, overcoming step-by-step -step problems of high vacuum, screening from harmful radiation, construction of special magnets, and so on. For the production of neutrons, deuteron beams are usually found the most convenient. When the deuteron strikes the target, it splits up, liberating a neutron, which easily penetrates to the nucleus. At last, the full power begins to flow. Through the observation window can be seen the arc in the center of the tank, and round it, the pulsation of the accelerating particles. Outside the laboratories, the world was disturbed by the strident voices of evil men and the ever louder rumble of approaching war. Hahn and Strassman's evidence that a disintegration of the unstable uranium gave rise to elements such as barium in the middle of the atomic table was purely chemical and required a physical confirmation before it could be accepted. The uranium nucleus is unstable and radioactive, as is known from its ability to emit an alpha particle. If a uranium nucleus could indeed capture a neutron, becoming more excited and splitting into two approximately equal fragments, it was to be expected that a large amount of energy would be released in such a process, the fission fragments being hurled apart with great velocity. Professor Frisch obtained confirmation that this was so in an experiment essentially similar to the one shown here. Uranium was placed in the ionization chamber, which was placed over the end of a bombarding tube through which high-energy deuterons could be sent. The chamber was connected, as you see, to an oscilloscope. The trace you see here is made by alpha particles from the radioactive uranium. Now the high-tension set is switched on, and the uranium is bombarded by neutrons. On the screen of the oscilloscope, the fission pulses reveal the large amounts of energy released when uranium atoms are split. If each fission had to be provoked by elaborate apparatus like this for accelerating particles, there was no hope of deriving useful energy from the process. But each fission was found to be accompanied by the release of a few neutrons. One neutron had been used to provoke the fission. The fission itself produces more than one neutron, and is thus itself capable of provoking more than one fission. 
and so on. There is thus the possibility of a self-sustaining chain reaction. The reaction can begin without any neutrons being supplied from outside, since a few fissions are always taking place spontaneously. These would supply the fused neutrons. The possibility of a fast chain reaction suggested an atomic bomb. There are two isotopes which make up the bulk of natural uranium. The atomic weight of one is 238, of the other 235. Over 99% of natural uranium is U238. U238 undergoes fission only with very fast neutrons. Many neutrons are scattered by uranium atoms and lose the speed necessary to cause fission. So, a divergent chain reaction will not take place in uranium which is predominantly U238. U235, on the other hand, undergoes fission with neutrons of any velocity. It seemed possible that a controllable chain reaction might be achieved by using slow neutrons to cause fission in U235. Using pure uranium metal containing both isotopes, a pile was built in which uranium rods were embedded in a mass of pure carbon in the form of graphite. Neutrons produced in the uranium were slowed down by collisions with the light atoms of the carbon, the moderator as it is called, giving them a chance to cause fission in U235. A slow controlled chain reaction was achieved on December the 2nd, 1942. If natural uranium and a moderator were replaced by a small amount of pure U235, slow neutron reactions would give place to fast neutron reactions. Fissions would occur, but so many neutrons would escape before hitting another nucleus that no chain reaction would build up. But if the amount of U235 became larger than a certain critical size, a fast chain reaction would take place in less than a millionth of a second. This would produce a violent explosion. A simple mechanism for an atomic bomb thus suggests itself. Take two pieces of U-235, each smaller than the critical size, but which, if placed together, exceed that size. They are driven together and... So U-235 became bomb material number one, and its separation from U-238 became a war priority. The behavior of U-238 in a pile is also of great importance. Slow neutrons are sometimes captured by U-238. No fission is caused, but this nucleus becomes U-239. This is unstable. A beta particle is emitted, causing a change to a new element with different chemical properties, Neptunium-239. This new element is also unstable. Another beta particle is given off, forming another completely new element, Plutonium-239. Now, plutonium-239 has fission properties similar to U-235 and will be built up by this process of neutron capture and subsequent beta disintegration throughout the uranium in the pile. Being a different element, it can be separated by chemical means from the uranium and used also for a bomb. So, plutonium is bomb material number two. Huge plots for the production of pure U-235 and of plutonium arose in the United States. By 1943, it had become plain that Great Britain was fully extended in war production. In consequence, her nuclear physicists crossed the Atlantic to continue with American and Canadian colleagues the brilliant work already done. The main practical effort and most of its prodigious cost now fell on the United States, where very active research had been going on since 1939. At last, in the desert of New Mexico, the first atomic bomb was set off under conditions of great secrecy. Thousands of calculations, years of work, reached their climax in this moment of dreadful splendor. Within a few weeks, the bomb burst upon Japan, and the news of it upon a startled world, which has now seen this supreme destroyer in action five times in all. 
We are aware now of the compelling urgency of the situation created by the bomb. We know that war must be banished, or else our civilization may die, as Hiroshima died on that summer morning in 1945. The tale has been told in full by those who lived through it. A city destroyed in an instant, 60,000 people dead, many from flesh burns, thousands more by blast, many from strange sicknesses caused by gamma radiation. For a short while, the world was content to accept the fact that atomic energy, by destruction, had brought peace. Then came the question, can this power be controlled to serve mankind? The core of the problem is to turn the atomic pile into an efficient heat engine. The release of energy in a pile results in the generation of heat. If the reaction is allowed to run fairly fast, a cooling system is necessary to absorb the heat. To control the rate of reaction, rods of cadmium or some such substance must be introduced which can absorb neutrons if lowered into the pile. Now, if the cooling fluid, probably helium gas, were passed through a heat exchanger containing water tubes, the water could be heated up and turned into steam. Most of this part of the installation would have to be screened off by heavy concrete or water shields and operated by remote control. The steam could be used to drive turbo generators to provide electricity in a powerhouse or in a big ship. This adaptation of the atomic pile as a source of heat energy is now being tackled in the United States and Great Britain. The use of radioactive byproducts from the pile is also being investigated. From Dalton's theory to atomic power. It is a long road, but the landmarks are clear. With the atomic theory as a basis, a pretty complete picture of the elements of our material world was fitted together during the 19th century. The discovery of electrons the realization of the nature of positive rays. The strange powers of X-rays revolutionized conception of the nature of matter and of the atom itself. The study of radioactivity, first investigated by Becquerel and then by the Curies, led Lord Rutherford to make the greatest single advance in atomic theory. He pictured a small heavy nucleus in the atom round which the electrons revolved. In 1919, Rutherford discovered how to change one element to another by bombardment with alpha particles. He suggested that the nucleus of the atom might contain protons and uncharged particles of about the same mass. In 1932, scientists could say with certainty that the atom contained electrons carrying unit negative charges and a nucleus built up of protons carrying unit positive charges and of neutrons, uncharged particles equal in mass to protons, whose existence was proved by Sir James Chadwick. In 1932 also, Cockcroft and Walton split the lithium atom by bombardment with protons and found that mass could actually be translated into energy in perfect accord with Einstein's theory. Atomic disintegrations provoked by great machines became a commonplace of well-equipped physics laboratories. In 1939, uranium fission was first noted. The possibility of a self-sustaining chain reaction suggested the wholesale release of energy. Controlled chain reactions were achieved in the atomic pile. The imagination of the world has been stirred by the prospect of adapting such piles to use as sources of heat energy and as sources of radioactive materials for use in medicine. In research laboratories, the scientists are even now writing fresh pages in this unfinished story. But overall, the smoke of the atomic bomb hangs like a pall. If we are to reach the future that promises so bravely, the peoples of the world must see that this new power is wisely used.